Hello there YouTube, and thank you for joining me today. Today's story is from reddit's r slash no sleep. It was posted by that exo guy. I'm a nurse for the elderly. One of the patients made a terrifying confession. Despite what some might tell you, it's not actually so bad to work in this field. Sure, some of the elderly can be difficult at times. And like any other job, this one has its stomach churning moments but most of them are sweethearts. All it takes is some compassion and patience to break through to them. So yeah, I mostly love this job. I wouldn't give it up if I could help it. The only part I don't like are the occasional confessions from some of the patients. They say that people can feel their ends nearing and after a few years working this job, I've come to believe that. Some of them have no one else no family or friends left, so they air their dirty laundry, so to say, in front of us nurses. Most of the time, it's pretty mild stuff. Old Gregory cheated on his wife in their 30s. Larry used to be into hardcore BDSM. Lisa stole from her company for a while. Stuff that you don't necessarily expect, but that doesn't surprise you in hindsight. Other times, it borders on disturbing. Jenkins had a bar fight and ran away, and to this day he's not sure if the other guy survived. Sasha had an abortion on her own without telling her boyfriend at the time that she was even pregnant. Sierra abandoned her family, running away in the night to start a new life, and seeing the missing persons poster ate her up inside. That's the kind of stuff that gets under my skin, but I can at least understand where they're coming from. I can sympathize even if I don't condone their actions. But then there are the monsters. The ones that have committed truly atrocious deeds and their confessions keep me up at night. Julia, the sweetest old lady you'd ever meet, gaslit her husband into suicide to cash out his life insurance. Freddy helped burn an entire village back in the Vietnam War, basking in the flames and the screams of the dying. Sally abused her child growing up to the point it caused a myriad of developmental problems. Mind you, I haven't been there myself for all these confessions. Us nurses tend to share, morbid as it might sound. Go ahead and judge if you want, but we didn't ask for those burdens to be placed on our shoulders and we'll seek relief wherever we can find it. Most of the time, it's just innocent gossip. The, you won't believe what Gus used to do when he was young type. Other times, there are tears and silent cries in the break room, stone cold expressions and pressing atmosphere, not a hint of levity to go around. But such is life in this field. Most of us have learned to live with it, and those who couldn't walked away. I myself am in the first camp, and I don't think last night will change my mind. Anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself. You need some context in order to better make heads or tails of this. It all started with Parker, so I should too. He's a bitter old man. No way to sugarcoat it. A tough nut to crack. Rage and hatred for everyone and anything simmering under the surface at all times. He's the type of person that won't be satisfied until your parade is soaked to the bone in rain. He's been here since before I was hired, so the other nurses warned me about him from day one. God help you if you have to interact with him. He can ruin your entire week just by opening his mouth, they told me. I didn't take them seriously, thinking he couldn't be that bad. Spoiler alert, he was but not in the ways you'd expect. He didn't get physically violent like some of the other elderly. He didn't fling stuff and soak diapers at us. He flung words. He knew how to make them cut and cut deep. Our first interaction happened when I had to check up on him and make sure he took his medicine. It was a nice evening, and I found old man Parker in his room lounging in his recliner. He faced towards the windows, back to the door, and he didn't bother to turn around and look at me when I entered. Good evening, Mr. Parker, 
I greeted. A fresh meat. He spat in a response laced with spite. I gritted my teeth and tried to sound polite when I answered. My name is Jessica, but fresh meat, he interrupted me. You won't last a month, so I won't bother learning your name. Now why are you here, fresh meat? I told him why, and he pointed at the empty pill bottle on the nightstand next to him. Then he returned to staring out the window at the sunset without another word, so I took my leave. This is how the first three weeks went by. I went over to his room for this or that. He made some snide remarks to insult me, and I held my tongue. It was clear he didn't want anyone around, especially me. But I was never a quitter, and I wasn't about to bend to the knee to some old fart with a vendetta against happiness itself. You still here? He asked him the fourth week when I passed by his room to change his bedding. My god, woman, you're about as smart as you are pretty. He was in his recliner again. Most of the evenings and nights were spent there. By day he'd be outside or in the common area, terrorizing everyone he happened upon. But as soon as dusk approached, he'd retreat to his room and peer out the window until he fell asleep in the recliner. I'd ignore his remarks, approaching the bed with a fresh set of sheets and pillowcases. What, did you swallow your tongue? Forget how words work. He kept pestering me. I took off the old sheet and discarded it to the floor, even though it wasn't all that dirty. That wouldn't be a big surprise. Honestly, the only thing surprising me is that you learned to speak in the first place. Now, I don't recommend doing what I did. Reacting, like I had. At that point, I should have thrown in the towel and walked away. But I didn't. After two weeks of abuse, like that, on the daily, I snapped. I threw the fresh sheets haphazardly on the bed and stomped over to his recliner. Listen here, you shriveled up ball sack. I went off on him. I don't know what your problem is, but I don't need this kind of treatment in my life. I'm not surprised that your family left you. With an attitude like that, I'd have dropped you out of the care home at the first chance I got as well. I hurled insult after insult at him digging deep to dredge out the nastiest side of me, fully expecting Parker to go off on me in return, but instead, he stood there and took all of it. With each colorful word leaving my mouth, the corners of his lips pulled a little further up into a satisfied grin. I only stopped when I ran out of breath, and he waited a moment to see if I was done. What did you say your name was again? He asked. Jessica. Jessica, he repeated, letting each letter roll off his tongue. Tell you what, I like you. And that was that. He returned to staring out the window, and I was able to carry out my work in peace. I regretted the outburst for a while, feared that it would somehow come back to bite me in the butt and get me fired, but... Parker didn't tell anyone. It was our little secret. Every day after that, he'd grin when he saw me. He still gave me lip, but it was different, more jovial. Not trying to insult me and drive me away, just to tease me. But I could work without him breaking down into tears afterwards, so I took my win. After a while, I started teasing him back. He'd call me an insult of the day, and I'd call him mine. We'd laugh it off and move on. What I'm trying to say is that we developed this weird bond, and I actually started having fun. I started looking forward to it. We didn't talk about anything else. I didn't know the first thing about him, and he didn't know the first thing about me. But in my eyes, that only added to the charm. Life moved on, and before I noticed, I'd been working there for years. Rumors about Parker abounded. Everyone had their theories and beliefs, but I couldn't confirm or deny any of them. The man was still as much of a mystery to me as he'd been on the first day. Then one day, about a month ago, things started to change. He'd make less comments. He'd spend more and more time in his room, isolating from everyone. Parker had already been very self-sufficient for someone his age, 
but he'd started needing help with things, and I could see it killed him on the inside. I didn't mind, that's what I was getting paid for, but the man had his pride. He refused to be seen by a medic and get treatment, so we all expected him to kick the bucket soon. A prospect that made everyone in that care home happy, but I for one dreaded it. Even so, I knew better than to try to talk him out of it. One evening, before I went home, I checked on him. Parker was in his usual spot on the recliner, drapes drawn aside and window wide open. The sun was already gone, sunken below the horizon, painting it red as night creeped in. He didn't acknowledge my presence, not until I stopped next to him. Hey, Jessica, he greeted, his voice a low rumble. I nearly went for a hey fart bone, but the sound of my name and the way that he said it gave me pause. For the first time in the many years I'd known him, he sounded serious for once. A pit of dread formed in my stomach. Everything okay, Mr. Parker? His lips curled at the corners, pulling his gaunt face into a smile. A dry, raspy chuckle left his throat, but he let my question linger in the air for a long moment. Going home for the night? he asked. Yes. Could you stay just a little while longer? Of course. I knew what this meant. Parker felt his time was coming and he wanted someone next to him. I leaned in to take his hand into mine, but a bastard will be a bastard to the very end. He slapped my hand away. So he stood there in awkward silence, watching the night settle outside. You're the closest thing I have to a friend, Jessica, he said out of the blue. The closest thing I have to a family. <laughs> he let out another chuckle, but it sounded sad. God, I'm so pathetic. I put a hand on his shoulder, and this time he didn't slap it away. I had no idea what exactly to say. Parker wasn't one for sappy speeches, so in the end I went with the truth. Blunt as it was, I figured he'd appreciate my honest opinion. It's your own fault for being a grumpy old fart. You could have had many friends here, so why? Do you have any other plans for tonight? He asked, and I nodded no. Then, can I answer your question with a story? Sure. He shifted in the recliner, biding his time as he searched for the right words. I'd seen it all before in the others. They think themselves ready to open up until the time comes to actually do it. With a sigh, he resigned himself to the situation and started speaking. Parker was born in a small town in the 1940s, right off the back of the Second World War. He'd had an older brother and a father, neither of which he remembers. The first died of some disease as a child, and the second got drafted and died overseas while Parker was still a baby. That left his mother alone to raise him, but they weren't the only ones struggling to make ends meet in that town. Most everyone else did, too. Life back then was harsh especially for isolated communities like theirs. But I had a decent enough childhood, Parker assured me. My mother did her best, working herself to the bone and going hungry most nights to make sure I wouldn't. He took a short pause, prying his gaze away from the window to make eye contact with me. I could tell he was uncomfortable. Dwelling on the past brought him a great deal of anguish. But he looked away from me after a long moment back at the dark world outside and continued speaking. Despite his mother's best efforts, his childhood was short-lived. Parker had to grow up fast, to become dependable, to help around the house and find work. It wasn't that uncommon back then. Kids as young as eight or nine working shoulder to shoulder with the adults. We didn't have much of a choice. Things such as getting an education or waiting until they were adults, those were little more than pipe dreams. But luckily, Parker was big for someone his age. At only 10, he was taller and stronger than his 15-year-old friends. He could handle his manual labor, and having an extra set of hands to go around 
a second breadwinder, did wonders for their household. Things such as getting an education or waiting until they were adults, those were little more than pipe dreams. But luckily, Parker was big for someone his age. At only 10, he was taller and stronger than his 15-year-old friends. He could handle his manual labor, and having an extra set of hands to go around, a second breadwinner did wonders for the household. I still remember getting my first ever pay, he said with a sad smile. A small sum, but I was proud. Mother wanted me to spend it on myself, to get something nice but I didn't. I bought a sack of flour for her to make bread out of, and I used the fabric to make myself a new pair of shorts. I'm... I'm so sorry, I stuttered. Yeah, me too. But time went on. Parker kept working throughout the years, living life one day at a time. Trouble was never far off, but he faced it head on. The adults always tried to shortchange him for his work, and the other kids tried to bully him out of his meager earnings regularly. The first time that happened, I came home empty-handed with a broken nose and a busted lip, he said bitterly. Five of them ganged up on me. It was a dog-eat-dog world back then. When he was about 13, his mother brought home a new man. Parker hoped for a change, a chance to have a father, a role model, someone to teach him how to be a man himself. He thought life would get easier. How wrong I was, he said. That man was an alcoholic abuser. Parker and his mother found out as much soon enough. Her, sooner than him, but he saw the signs. Even though he still worked and brought his earnings home, food was suddenly in short supply. His mother always had bruises that she tried to hide, and his stepfather was always drunk. When I returned home beaten up again by the older kids, I was hopeful for once. I thought he'd go out there and do something about it. And... and he didn't? I asked with hesitation. Parker huffed. (laughs) He beat me up as well for being a sissy in his own words. It better not happen again, you hear me? He said that the next time I come home empty-handed, he'd show me real hell. Why didn't you run away? Or get the authorities involved? Run away? Where to? Parker answered. And the authorities didn't give a crap. He kept enduring the abuse, for the sake of his mother. Couldn't leave all alone with his stepfather. But it escalated gradually, and soon enough, his stepfather would take Parker's money outright. Then he'd beat his mother out in the open. It wasn't long until he raised his hand at me on the regular, Parker said. But it kept my mother safe, so I endured it. On the nights I get beaten up, she was safe. And those nights only got more common as time went on. At first, Parker would get beaten up for stepping in, taking the place of his mother. Then he'd get beaten up for not bringing enough money home. Then for no reason at all. At some point, I couldn't take it anymore. I... I snapped, Parker admitted. The other kids stole my money again, and I was afraid to go home that night, afraid of what he'd do to me. So I... I ran off into the woods looking for a place to sleep, and instead I found this old well. Old well? I asked, not sure what it had to do with anything up to that point. Old well, Parker confirmed. You know, a hole in the ground for people to get drinking water. I know what a well is. At any rate, he found this old well, a dilapidated old thing, long out of use and in serious disrepair. Parker nearly fell down into it when he learned Lini. At any rate, he found this old well, a dilapidated thing, long out of use and in serious disrepair. Parker nearly fell down into it when he leaned over the edge to peer down. He threw a pebble into it, but it never landed. Then he tried spitting into it and yelling into the shaft. It echoed for a long time, much longer than it should have. 
Parker listened in awe as his own voice reverberated in from the well for minutes on end, not getting any fainter. But all aside, it gave him an idea. I didn't like the sound of that. I did end up returning home that night, Parker said. Found him beating up my mother since I wasn't there, and he chased me when he saw me. Parker led his stepfather out of the town and into the woods, farther away from civilization, deeper and deeper between the trees until he heard the faint echo of the well still calling out. I hid nearby and kept quiet, he said. Waited for him to find the well, and he did. He'd heard the echoes of my scream, and thought I fell down into the darn thing trying to hide. That guy really laughed about it. His stepfather approached the well and leaned over the edge, still laughing. Did you learn your lesson yet, you damn bastard? Parker imitated him. Little did he know that I did. It just wasn't the lesson he wanted me to learn. Parker burst out from his hiding place while his stepfather was distracted and ran up to him. All it took was a single push, he said grimly. A single push, and he tumbled over the edge, fell into that abyss head first, screaming all the way to the bottom. From that day onward, the echo of his voice joined mine in the well. The authorities pretended to search for him for a few days, but no one truly gave a crap. He was just an alcoholic bastard, so everyone who thought he'd gotten his own comeuppance, that he'd died in a ditch somewhere, or that he ran away in search of greener pastures or other people to terrorize. No one suspected us, Parker said. Not my mother, who was too weak to fight back, and they considered me just a kid. No way in their eyes for either one of us to kill an adult man. With him out of the picture, though, Parker's life improved somewhat. He still earned a pittance, and the other kids still bullied him, but at least he could rest easy in his own home. I went to that well every day at first, then every other day, then once a week at once. But the screams never stopped, day and night. They got fainter, barely a whisper in the wind, but I could still hear them. Didn't it scare you? It terrified me, Parker admitted. But I also saw the possibilities. That answer terrified me. I contemplated for a moment to call it a night, to put an end to Parker's confession and leave. But I was also curious, for better or worse. Next up were the kids that bullied me, Parker continued. It took me a long time to build up the courage to even consider it, but enough abuse will push reasonable men to unreasonable actions. The gang was five members strong, their leader, 19 years old, and the youngest about Parker's age. The rest were all in between, starving street urchins, Parker called them, either orphans with the or with home lies similar to his own that pushed them to run away and brave the world. Except they were lazy, Parker said. They took the easy way out, stealing, conning, and bullying other kids, like they did to me. The community wasn't happy with them, but they never targeted adults so they were tolerated, until they beat up Parker for the hundredth time and he decided he'd had enough. I only wanted to get rid of their leader, he said. Thought their little clique would break apart without him, but I couldn't separate them. Parker tried to challenge him to a one-on-one -on -one fight outside of town, but he came with the rest of his gang and he was pissed. You could see the bloodlust in his eyes from a mile away, and I knew they'd give me hell like never before, so... I... I had no choice. All five of them had to go. Parker ran away, and just like his stepfather, they chased him into the woods. He hid near the well again, and when they got closer to inspect the echoing voices, Parker repeated his earlier stunt. I pushed the oldest boy first, he said in a stone-cold voice. Then, 
Before the others had a chance to wise up, I pushed the second oldest as well. The others were smaller. I could take them. They, they tried to run away to escape with their lives, but I couldn't let them. Parker chased them down, and he caught up to the youngest first. He tripped the boy from behind and stomped on his knee to break it, and then kept going. The second one, he grabbed by the shoulders and swung into a tree head first, breaking his neck. I tackled the last one and got him into a chokehold. He kicked his legs and clawed at my arms, tried to bite me a few times. When he realized he couldn't break free, he started pleading, begging for his life. Told me he wouldn't speak a single word about what was happening there. He begged like that all the way to the well until his legs were over the edge. The boy with the broken neck followed, and the one with the broken leg dragged himself quite the distance by the time Parker had got to him. But he went through with it, and that night the well gained five more voices. Parker stopped his retelling for a moment and stared off into the distance. At first I thought he was either giving me a breather, but maybe a bit of time to process what I'd heard, or that he was searching for the words. I looked outside as well, and the silhouette of a tree against a starry night sky shook in the distance. A reverberating scream followed. We don't have much time left. I have to hurry up, Parker whispered. I was frozen by his side when he picked the story back up. In shock, in fear, not knowing what was about to go down or what I should do, I'd witnessed a few confessions by that point, but none of them even came close to Parker's. He confessed to six murders in just as many minutes, and I was sure there'd be a few more by the time he was done with me. The guilt ate me up inside, he confessed. I went by the well every single day, fighting back the urge to jump into it myself. No one missed those kids, and no one in the community blamed Parker. He wasn't the only one getting bullied by them, and on some level, everyone was glad they were gone. One less problem in their lives, so they were happy to pretend the five ran off somewhere to carry out bigger heists. I was depressed for years because of it, but I kept telling myself that I had to do it, that my life was better now. Lies I only half believed, but they got me out of bed in the morning. Another tree shook outside, closer to us. There wasn't a scream this time. Parker flinched visibly. Anyway, the years flew by. People kept leaving the small town, flocking to big cities in search of work. I was one of them. I found this wonderful girl, and I left with her. They took Parker's mother as well. The three of them found work at some factory or another, and for a few years, he thought he'd left the small town and his horrible deeds behind. Until I started hearing screams in the night. Voices I recognized. I thought I was imagining it at first. I tried to convince myself it was nothing more than me going insane with guilt. Another tree shook outside, followed by a howl. And let me guess, it was all too real. Parker nodded his head. My mother went missing one evening, and we never found her. The big city police took it a bit more seriously, but they couldn't dig up a single lead. No witnesses, no suspects, nothing. But Parker knew exactly where to find her, or what was left of her. After a long trip back to his hometown and a trek through the woods, his worst fears were confirmed. His mother's voice joined the tortured chorus in the well. I broke down right then and there, cried in that forest by myself all night long. It was supposed to be me, not her. He returned home though, if only for the sake of his girlfriend and soon-to-be wife. She was pregnant, they'd soon have their first child and Parker wanted a better life for them than he'd had growing up. He'd be there for his kids, there for his wife, there to make sure that they'd be alright. They got married with little fanfare, a few friends and 
even fewer family members for a proper wedding, and their child was born a couple of months later. The most beautiful baby girl in the world, Parker explained with a glint in his eyes. Holding her, hearing her crying, it was all I ever wanted. Enough to justify everything I'd done and been through in a heartbeat. Another tree shook outside, and something took contour in the underbrush at the edge of the property. I let out a yelp and Parker reached for me. He grabbed my forearm and held me steady as I tried to back away. We still have a few minutes, he said calmly, and don't worry, it's not here for you. You're safe. He proceeded with the rest of his story, and I had to try my damned hardest to divide my attention between him and whatever it was out there. I treasured every moment with my wife and daughter, but you know how these things go. She grew up in a heartbeat. Before I realized it, she spoke her first words, took her first steps, moments I couldn't be prouder of as a father. The thing bellowed, a guttural sound that rattled my bones. Dying animal was my first thought, a coyote getting murdered or a fox going into heat. It took a step forward into the faint circle of light surrounding the care home, and I saw a human face and then another one, and another, contorted in agony and held together in some gigantic head form. Then that thing returned once more, Parker said, raising a hand to point at the advancing beast. More cries in the night, more screams and howls. I knew what it wanted, but, but I couldn't let it have me or my family. Another step brought his neck and torso into view, pulsing muscles crisscrossing each other at random, skin stretched until it pulled taut, dozens of human arms jutting in and out of it at random places, its myriad of eyes moving every which way, scanning, searching. I knew I had to do something before it was too late, to either get rid of it or appease it, and... I knew what it wanted. What? I asked, stuttering and shaking with fear. People. Bodies. Victims, Parker answered. More of them. I opened up its appetite and now it was hungry. If I didn't give it what it wanted, it would get it itself. Take my world from me. I didn't want to do it. I tried to talk myself out of it up until the very last moment, but I was pressed for time and worried sick for my family, so I went back to the town. For a moment, I wished my eyes could do the same thing the creatures did. I wanted to turn and look at Parker, to see his face, but I didn't dare take my eyes off of it. Every last muscle in my body was clenched, holding me in place. I was barely able to breathe. I took another step forward, and all of those dead, beady eyes focused, every last one of them pinned on the window of the room, on me and Parker. I just kidnapped someone, Parker said, his voice fraying into a cry at the edges. An older man, living all by himself. I knew him. I knew he'd been a widower for decades, and he knew me. He barely fought back as I tied and gagged him. I expected him to plead as well, like the kids had. I expected him to fight me, but the silence, it was worse somehow. Did he know about that thing? I managed to push out a question. What? No. Of course not, Parker answered. He was just old and frail. And ah, uh, and he knew he couldn't do anything to stop me. Maybe he'd given up on life long ago, like I ended up doing. I don't know. The rest of the monster came into view as it advanced toward the open window. There was so much more to it that I expected. 
so many legs moving haphazardly, slapping the lawn at awkward angles to pull the body along. It felt surreal, like the window was a screen and I was merely watching some cheap horror movie with an even cheaper special effect. At night, I dragged the old man out of town and through the woods. I got him to the well, said a short prayer for his soul, and tipped him over the edge. He went down without a sound. The monster stopped a few feet away from the window and craned its head forward. By that point, I was pretty much useless, more of an ornament than an active participant. Parker let go of me and moved to get up, failing twice. His old bones were all out of strength, but he still had his determination. Third attempt saw him to his feet, even if a bit wobbly. I returned to my wife and daughter after that, he said, taking a step towards the window. And all was fine for a while. Seeing her smile, growing up, having her by my side, it kept the guilt at bay. She was my world and I was ready to do anything to keep my world from crumbling. The monster cooed. One of its many faces moved across its skin, pushing up against the rest until it got to the forefront. A wide smile took over its lips, replacing the agonized expression. The next time the screams returned, I knew what I had to do. I knew what the rest of my life would be like what sins I had to commit. Every few years I'd return to that cursed town, kidnap someone in the dead of night and throw them into the well. The smile at the front of the forefront only grew wider, but the rest didn't match. They started whispering aggressively, their voices merging as they got louder. I kept at it until my daughter grew up, until she found a boy she wanted to marry and moved out until everyone left that town behind to be an empty shell for the forest to retake. And I called it a job well done. I thought my daughter was safe and I could finally let the monster take me, that I'd finally atone for my sins. Parker closed the gap to the window and so did the monster. It pushed its many arms into the room, hands both big and small grasping at the air as they tried to reach him. And what happened to her? I asked. The question felt strange coming out of my throat and leaving my mouth, like it was uttered by someone a million miles away, completely detached from the situation. Parker extended one of his arms, but paused to turn and face me. What do you think happened, Jessica? He asked in a somber voice. What do you think pushed me on the run for the rest of my life? made me grow weary of approaching people and making friends. I held back the answer, if only because I had one more question. Why tell me all of this? Parker smirked, that same mischievous, crap-eating grin I'd gotten used to from him. Because I'm a selfish old bastard, he said matter-of-factly. I wanted at least one person to know and maybe miss me. And now you do. He took the final step that brought him within the monster's reach, and it got a hold of his arm with 100 fingers. The many eyes looked past Parker, directly at me. Thank you, Jessica, Parker said, his back to me. You can leave now. That would be best. I didn't argue with him on that. I slowly walked backwards to the door. My head was heavy, mind spinning, and my legs felt like unsteady stilts a hundred feet long. But I did it. I reached the door, backed out into the corridor, and closed it gently. Parker watched me the whole time, a peaceful smile on his lips, until the latch clicked. The rest of the night was a blur. I wandered into the break room with tears streaming down my face. But I didn't even realize I was crying until I tried to light a cigarette and a tear fell on it. My hand shook like an earthquake and so did the rest of me. I smoked about half the pack, waiting and praying for that thing to leave so I could too. A couple of hours later, I finally built up the courage to bolt out of the care home and into my car. 
I drove home in a haze, eyes darting at every little movement, and I didn't manage to sleep a wink until the break of dawn. But I returned to the care home for my next shift, looking like a ghost. Police were there, interrogating everyone about Parker's disappearance, and I lied to them. I couldn't possibly tell them the truth. Not when I don't even know where that damned well thing is. So yeah, I lied until they left me alone. I lied until they packed in their car and drove off. Everyone else is awfully happy that Parker is finally gone, and I stand out among them like a sore thumb, sitting in his recliner, writing this as the sunset approaches. I realize he was right on both accounts. He was a selfish old bastard, and he left behind someone who misses him.